Yes. Um, well, 5 p.m. for some and 10 p.m. for others. So um, when you're ready, you can stop sharing that, Wayne. Well done. And uh, I will just um, say, uh, well, it's either good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, warm welcome on behalf of Moray House Trust to a talk about the 1945 fire and the Phoenix City. This is the third in a series of short talks on the theme of reimagining Georgetown, reflections on the past built environment in the city. In the first talk, we learned a little about how the city of Georgetown was planned and how its public spaces, public facilities and public buildings evolved in the second talk, we looked at specific houses over a period of time to assess their adaptability and durability, to discuss aspects such as fenestration and ventilation, and to trace the emergence of distinctly Guyanese architectural styles and features. Today, we revisit the traumatic events of the 1945 fire and the extensive and coherent plans for regeneration of the four acres of the city center affected by the fire. For those joining us for the first time tonight, Moray House Trust is a private non-partisan nonprofit based in Georgetown and dedicated to promoting Guyanese culture and public discourse. My name is Isabel de Carries. I'm the chair of trustees at Moray House Trust and the moderator for this event. A warm welcome to our regulars. Please note that the event is being live streamed via Facebook and YouTube. If you are on Zoom and would prefer not to be visible, please turn off your video, which is you can do at the bottom left of your Zoom screen. Our speaker, Wayne McQuart, will be familiar to some as the curator of the popular Wooden Architecture Guyana Heritage group on Facebook. He's also written in the local media about some of the historical events discussed here. We will start um, by showing Wayne's talk, which lasts about half an hour. Afterwards, we welcome comments and questions. Please keep, I'll say this again uh, when we get to that point, but please keep the comments and questions brief so that we can also accommodate questions from the other platforms. Right, um, I am going to start the uh, video now. Masher Mani or Mash is a calendar event in Guyana which is held every 23rd of February to celebrate the country becoming a republic in 1970. It is primarily a festival of song, parades and floats depicting various aspects of celebrating Guyana as a nation. As the festivities claim the streets of Georgetown, little do most participants realise that on that very date 75 years ago, disaster struck the city of Georgetown. On the afternoon of Friday, February 23rd, 1945, the conflagration, the great fire as it came to be known, devastated the commercial and cultural heart of Georgetown. There's still among us a few eyewitnesses to the disastrous fire, and perhaps we may hear some of their recollections if they happen to be listening. There's no shortage of accounts of the great fire. I've chosen to quote Vincent Roth's account as he witnessed the events firsthand and was well placed at the time to describe the disaster. At the time in 1945, Vincent Roth was a legislator, librarian and second editor of the Daily Chronicle. 
Its building at the head of Main Street, and at the same time office of the Royal Agricultural and Commercial Society, which was opposite the fateful Booker's building. His description is vivid, and I quote, Around half past three in the afternoon of Friday 23rd of February 1945, I was in the director's room at the Royal Agricultural and Commercial Society going through some correspondence with Miss Martin's librarian. It was a bright sunny afternoon. Suddenly the usual street noises were disturbed by a terrific short sharp explosion. With an explanation of hell that was no tire, I rushed to the window looking out on Church Street, but for a few moments observed nothing out of the ordinary, no smoke visible anywhere, the traffic continuing as usual, but for one or two pedestrians stopping and looking about them to ascertain the cause of the explosive noise. From now on, things began to move fast. Within a couple of minutes, a brilliant flame was spouting out of all the windows facing Church Street, while a deep and ominous roar of sound, to which nothing is comparable, began to come from the doomed building. End quote. It was at 3.30pm that afternoon that Ivan Morris, an employee of Booker's Drug Stores, located where now the gun stores, was pumping alcohol from a drum into a permanent vat when there was a sudden explosion. This was due to a blowtorch in an adjoining room where repairs were effect being effected. The flames spread rapidly, being fed by large stocks of alcohol and essential oils, which were held on the premises. The fire quickly spread and enveloped most of the other adjacent buildings in the heart of Georgetown between Water Street, Church Street and Rob Street. Vincent Roth continues the narrative, quoting, I never for one moment dreamt that the fire would cross the fairly wide street and the grass lawn that separated the museum and the library from the street. I realised the danger of these sparks and ordered the windows to be shut. When I looked out, Booker's Drug Store to the east and Booker's Garage to the west were both on fire. The heat in the vicinity of Church Street and Water Street was becoming unbearable. The roof of the Georgetown Club now caught, and within 15 minutes the whole structure was a mass of ruined flames. The fire jumped across Hinks and North Streets, and in a few minutes the Museum and Royal Agriculture and Commercial Society and General Post Office were masses of flames. My next thoughts were to my office in the Daily Chronicle building, where I kept all my legislative counsel and other correspondence. Vincent Roth goes on to mention the gallant efforts made by the staff from the surrounding buildings, who were fighting the fire to save their premises from the flames. The sudden fa facade of the Daily Chronicle escaped with smoking and blistered wooden windows due to the staff valiantly dousing the external wall with any supply of water at hand. Across the road, a garden hose was being sprayed on the wooden doors of the Carnegie Public Library. By the late afternoon, there was the sound of explosions, as the authorities were dynamiting some of the buildings on the waterfront. Vincent Roth concludes, quote, By seven o'clock the fire was under control. With a friend, I climbed up to the top of the Chronicle House, where a terrible sight met my eyes. Where a few hours ago had st stood the business heart of the city, now spread several acres of black and smouldering debris. End quote. The value of the buildings destroyed by the 945 fire was estimated at over $18 million, excluding the value of the material and stock, not to mention the value of the library and exhibits from the Natural History Museum, the Royal Agricultural and Commercial Society, which was burnt out for the second time, the previous occasion being 1864. The Commission of Inquiry into the Origin of the 945 fire was conducted by Mr. Sidney Van Battenberg Stafford, QC, the blame for the fire fell between Messrs. Booker's, the Town Council and the Government for neglect of non-enforcement of the regulations. So this is a model of Georgetown commercial area circa 1940, obviously dating slightly before that. And, and this is a model in the Guyana Museum, which I think should really be photographed properly and because it's a very good example of give, showing us an exact location of how things were. And it was designed way back presumably in the 1940s. And that gives us a very clear idea of the scale of the building, what the city was like. And as we can see, it'd be very crowded with the buildings fairly close to each other. 
And that's an actual photograph, more or less, of the same thing at the same time. So we get an idea from the photograph what we've just seen in that model form. Yeah, so we started the hand in hand building with the flat profile along High Street. So moving north, we get this large mass of the assembly room buildings up here, which on the upper floor. And on the door, lower floor, we had the Georgetown Club. Behind here, going off to the north would be Main Street. And then going further west again, we obviously have the Chronicle building somewhere behind here. And then we move back along um, Church Street. This would be the Booker's building, is actually where the fire actually started. And if we move along the flank towards the west of the Booker building, going all the way, it takes us right down to Water Street. And what you can't see in the picture, if we then come around into Water Street, we then come to where we meet Sandwich Parker, that part of Sandwich Parker. And then if we come up to North Street, which would then bring us back down here to the, where the post office was. And of course, hidden behind here would be the whole flank of the museum. Just be, you can't actually see it in the photograph here. So these are the buildings that um, in black, the ones blacked out were the ones actually burnt down. The ones in yellow were really the ones that sort of retained the fire. Starting here, you had the, if I can work with the yellow ones, first of all, you had the Chronicle building in Main Street, which almost went up in flames, I think was just about saved. So you had the whole complex of Booker's stores here, with Booker's Universal and Booker's Drugstore where the fire started. And then we move around into Water Street with the Sandwich Park building. And there again, that was buffeted by fire by the Barclays Bank, the old Barclays Bank DCO, which was a concrete building. And then in the center of case, of course, we had the Royal Agricultural Commercial Society and, and the museum, that complex there that went. And then here we had what was Fogarty's store. And then five would be the general post office and seven would be assembly hall. So the whole area in black was more or less completely obliterated. And as I said, we had the hand in hand building here, which was built of stone, which obviously ironically stopped the fire going that way. And we had the BG Mutra building here, which stopped it going any further. And this building here was the Royal Bank of Canada, which was the old wooden building, which got destroyed. And of course, we had the public library across the way, which was relatively safe at the time. So even the British colonial government at the time was very quick off their feet. In two days into after the fire, somebody got up in the House of Commons and talked about the fire in Georgetown. They immediately, there were regulations and improvements in place to, to the ordinances to things to be put in place. And architects were appointed. And the main architects were W.H. Watkins and Graham Partners. And they were the ones who were going to rebuild places like the Booker's, uh, Fogarty's, and I think they were going to build, that's right, and the Sandwich Park as well. So planning was one of the sort of key words of the age. And the object of town planning was not uh, merely to ensure orderly and dignified development, but to reconcile conflicting claims to the use of the land. But as we can see from the fire had left behind one of those clashes between the people who wanted the land for culture and those who wanted it to be regenerated for new industry, new building, new commerce. Now this is actually the plan as it looked. The dark bits, first of all, were the, the buildings were built by architects Ash and Watson. And they had a, they were building, first of all, the post office building in the center here. And then they were building Sandwich Parker and the Booker's building and the Fogarty's building. So those four buildings were actually built by Ash and Watkins. And hence, if you look at their architectural design, they're very similar in terms of what they were trying to achieve. Taking you down up from, this is Main Street, and the circulation comes here past, uh, first of all, if you see the development of the city, we've got these roundabouts, which are created for the traffic, which was obviously a new creation. We still had this memorial, war memorial in the center there, which gave that a circular um, roundabout. And we come along, Church Road here, where we had a road planting. And then that took us round into a new developed car park for the park cars, which obviously were going to be used at the city. But, and then the circulation came all the way down Water Street and clearly right down the ground through this Rock Street along here, and then back into High Street. And looking at the plots, you can see mainly there are spaces left between the buildings. The post office has its complete plot itself, which gives it protection against any fire damage. 
So most of the buildings were secure in that respect. And going back to the Booker's building here, at the side of that, we had the new Ferrer and Gomes building. That was built at the same time by a different architect. And of course, we had the Barclays Bank building, which still stood up the test of time because it was built of stone. And we had the new replacement for the Royal Bank of Canada, which was built surprisingly within two years, I think in 1948, after being burnt out in 1945, the new Royal Bank of Canada appeared there in 1948. It's like a huge Art Deco building. And of course, we still had the BG Mutual building here. And then, of course, you have the hand in hand building. So, looking at the plan of the city, fairly simple. We see lots of green planting around the city. And it obviously gave space for cars and parking and much more circulation around the city, period. And on the right here, we have the Fogarty's building. And there we have the post office now, which is set back slightly from the road. So the whole bit of urban planning gives us more spaciousness. The buildings are slightly set back from the road. There's obviously more road for vehicular traffic to circulate. And as you can see from the new building here, we had parking spaces around. And this little famous photograph, which I think was a famous postcard at the time, gives you an idea of the, the amount of traffic in the city. And at the same time, showing you the amount of planting that was going on in, in the city at the same time. This is a very interesting slide. I put it in here because it shows an old part of Georgetown in that vicinity, which has actually changed. And it's really the only change that's taken place. This is actually a view of Hink Street. We've got the post office tower. At that time, it may have been the Tower Hotel. We're not quite sure. So we've got the Tower Hotel, which is on Hink Street. And we're actually looking from Church Street all the way down Hink Street. When we come later to the plan, we'll see that after the fire, this is the one change that was made in Georgetown where Hink Street no longer comes all the way into Rob Street, into, from Rob Street into Church Street. It acts as a cul-de-sac. So we'll see that further when we come along with the plan. So this is the old, I think from the date this photograph is probably more likely to be in the Tower Hotel before it became the actual GPO. And Hink Street used to run all the way across to Church Street from that old photograph that we saw. So when the new post office building was built. It was built right across the old plot of land. So in fact, we get that T-junction now with Rob Street and Hink Street, whereas before the post office was just on this block here and that ran all the way through to the main Church Street there. So that's, I think that's one of the only major difference in the planning out to 1945. Um, this here must be the Booker's Brothers area. So we're looking up Church Street here, and on the corner here, we have the public library across the way, and the Booker's Drugstore where the fire itself started. And that, of course, is the fire itself in process from the, just about where the Cenotaph was. So we get a rather graphic vision of the fire. And this is the Booker's area being redeveloped, and these were some of the architect's plans for the development of Booker's Universal Store. And this was the result um, in the early 1950, 51, 52, when the store was first opened. So that gives us an imaging of what it was like now. Of, and, and hasn't changed all that much because the good thing about planning, um, what the architects did, they made the foundations of the Booker's building strong enough to take extra floors. So although we see a one floor building here, if we look at later photographs of the Booker's now uh, kind of stores, they've actually managed to build another story here. And the idea was to go as far as they can to use the tower here to act as a lift shaft. So that gives you a very practical way of looking forward into the future. So this was the post office building. As I said, the post office building started as a tower hotel. And then um, the post office inhabited it later. Uh, during the period of the fire, obviously they were, they were, the building itself got burnt down. And then it was rebuilt in 1951, and this is what the building looked like. I think it was the early stages. It was that white color, then it became a sort of pinkish color. And this is the Rob Street facade of the building. Now I've inserted this little sculpture here, which is very significant. There's a long story behind that, which we can tell another time. But that sculpture was meant to be in that clock space. And this is a bit of culture which Guy has actually lost because it was actually the sculpture done by Frank Dobson, which is one of the most important British sculptures in the 20th century. 
and Ghana had the opportunity of having the sculpture placed there because the architects specifically wanted that sculpture there. But the politics of Georgetown and the good people of Georgetown decided it wasn't suitable. So it was completely lost, unfortunately. So it's, that's a missing bit of, it was, made, it was only a clay model at the time. So it never really survived beyond that photograph. So here we have the other buildings. We have the assembly hall across there, which also accommodated on the ground floor of the um, Georgetown Club. And that's it going up in flames. And this is another picture looking down High Street, where you get that view looking down High Street, that's time with hand in hand in the corner, and looking now towards the RACS building. And this is the assembly rooms and the fire as well. And then this is the Royal Agricultural Commercial Society, which took the brunt of another fire. They had been on that particular site since its foundation in 1844. And their building was destroyed in the 1864 fire. So the 1945 fire was a, a great blow, as you can imagine, to that particular institution. And um, to position it, want well, to appreciate the positioning of it, if you look at the photograph down below of the new building of the museum, and the, that space in front um, where we have that park now, the building itself used to actually sit right onto Water Street itself. So where we've got that garden, which is placed there later on in the new planning, the actual RACS buildings and reading rooms were actually onto the street itself, really. And then, of course, in the time it became, it was first of all, it housed the post office and the pilot's office. And uh, we had <clears throat> Demerara Electric Company, and then above were the famous um, reading rooms. And this was a new rebuilt building, which was built in 1952, which is still there. And that's the only building that still carries the name of Georgetown. So the Great Fire signaled the demise of the old style of Georgetown's business quarters. The reconstruction that followed it dragged the city into the modern age where planning and new building materials were the way forward. The loss of the old was an optimism for new beginnings. So we had the new build, rebuilding of the new city. I mean, there were certain optimistic views about the future of Georgetown because it gave people a chance to look forward. Ironically, if one imagines Georgetown during 1945, what was this? At the end of the Great World War, Georgetown had been not really affected by the war in no material collateral damage. And if one thinks of what was happening in London, London still just recovering from a blitz, and probably even in the 1960s, you still found bombed out sites. So the fact that Georgetown literally dragged its cells up in 1945, and between the five years between 1945 and 1950, that whole part of the city was completely regenerated, which is quite remarkable. And one of the great plans was to have um, a new cultural center because we had the Royal Agricultural Commercial Society, which dominated that whole site, which was Company Path, which ran all the way back to High Street. And they were a very august body and they had obviously royal patronage. And when it was time to rebuild, they were quite adamant that they wanted to retain that particular bit of land because as you can imagine, with any new planning, they were in competition with <clears throat> the commercial part of the city. But they were quite adamant that they wanted to be restored on the original site. And then, of course, the end, they managed to, to achieve that. But their whole aim was to have a new cultural organization whereby um, they had help from the British Council. And the whole idea was to have a new library with the British Council's help and to have an area which would be a central focus for information with probably a tourist office in one central point. And that was all part of their planning. And at the same time, have the museum incorporated because the museum during the fire had just moved from the public library. So most of their collections were actually saved because at that period of time, the government were actually in charge of the museum, but laterally the museum then came back to the RACS. So there was a lot of cultural activity and planning going on there. So the idea was to secure that site as a cultural site. The assembly rooms were obviously um, I think the land was actually owned by the RACS as well. So that gave an area, a concert hall, and the idea was to have uh, the museum, possibly an art gallery, and of course the library reading rooms, and of course the Carnegie Public Library. Well, in the end, it didn't quite work that way. I think in the end, the, the British Council had to put their offices temporarily in the, in the library, the Carnegie Library. So the plan of that cultural hub never quite came off in the end, but it was still quite a good um, promising aspect because 
we had negotiation between the city council where they were trying to plan for the future and at the same time accommodate commercial businesses at the same time, which presumably would have continued around the ring into Water Street. After the 1945 fire, a new system of building would undoubtedly take the place of those now in ruins. And this meant the erection of fire resistant buildings. The Royal Agricultural and Commercial Society was set from day one after the fire to reconstruct their building in concrete, having suffered two disastrous fires in their 100 year history. Their new building design by the architects Watkins, Gray, and Partners was later readapted to fit into the new unified planning scheme for the whole area under reconstruction. This included the General Post Office, Sandwich Parker, Booker Brothers, and William Fogarty. By the beginning of the 1950s, modernism had become the style associated with the 20th century and used in all manner of buildings. Modern architecture is based on the evolution of new building technologies and materials that can create stronger, taller and lighter buildings. In the Georgetown reconstructions, material like hollow clay blocks were used by the architects as a replacement for the traditional wooden structures that perished in the conflagration. Not only were these new buildings better designed to withstand any fire damage, but the architects, in this case Watson, Gray and Partners, and the contractors Ash and Watson, were also able to embrace the new architectural design ideas that had been around in Europe in the 1930s by the Bauhaus, Le Corbusier and the modern movement. What the new buildings had in common were new concrete structures supported on 50-foot deep concrete piles reinforced concrete floors and frames, and flat profile roofs and concrete projecting canopies over the pavements. The new buildings were erected on their original business sites. Form followed function. Each new building had an identity of its own, and this is noticeable in the varied fenestration designs which served either to enhance the natural breezes or designed to alleviate the direct heat of the sun. The U-shaped design of the General Post Office building, for example, made the best use of prevailing northeasterly trade winds. On the north and east side, there were wide verandas for the protection from the rain and concrete louvers on the west side to keep out the western sun. The western windows of William Fogarty building have metal with glass louvers for permanent ventilation. In the Sandwich Park building, Windows are galvanized steel, horizontal and pivot hung, and glazed with non-acidic glass. The southern facade of Booker's Universal Building has a fenestration of tall clerestory lights, almost a glass curtain wall, but within the structural lobe. This architecture is often described as a faceless international style, but I think the overall planning and placement of the new Georgetown concrete buildings were hugely successful. Quoting again from Vincent Roth, I quote here, No cloud is without a silver lining. The four acres of blackened debris blossomed within ten years into the present business and cultural centre, the most imposing in the British territories. Quote. The replanning turned the commercial centre into an open piazza, affording wide pavements for the circulation of pedestrians and shoppers and pleasant planting, yet allowed a flow of traffic and parking in its midst. And I personally recall in the late 1950s as a pleasant enough place to visit. Going into town, as we say, meant a morning visit to the Water Street banks or business in the post office, perhaps collecting mail from your mailbox, dropping into the reading rooms and a wander through Fogarty's and ending up at the soda fountain in Booker's Universal store. These buildings in the commercial centre have been around for over 70 years, well within some of our living memories. They seemingly structurally sound, but perhaps a bit run down, and the Sandwich Park building was lost in a fire recently. Can you now reimagine what could replace them? Fires have been endemic in Georgetown since the first official recorded fire in the Royal Gazette on the 1st of April 1815 in Work and Rust. There was all renewal and growth, but once again in the aftermath of the Great Fire of 1945, Georgetown rose again from the ashes like the mythical phoenix, but this time it was within our living memories. 
The disastrous fire, however, had struck a note of optimism with hope for renewal and progress. James Rodway, who died in 1926, was spared witnessing the loss of all his life's work at the Museum and the Royal Agricultural and Commercial Society. But even then, he struck a note of optimism, recalling the 1864 fire, which he said, quote, A blessing in disguise gave the society a new lease of life. End of quote. Mr. Luke M. Hill was the municipal engineer and superintendent of Georgetown from 1878 to 1910, and also a fellow Georgetown resident like Rodway. His obituary in 1921 mentions the curious coincidence he had in December 1913. He dreamt that the Lombard Street district of Georgetown was in ruins, and the streets cut up and swamped with water, learning only two days later that it had been destroyed by fire. And to quote Luke Hill in 1915, quote, Curiously enough, Georgetown's chief structural improvements have followed disastrous fires, provided an opportunity to construct better streets, houses and sanitary facilities, end quote. More words of optimism, this time from Eric Roberts, who at the time in 1945 was one of Guyana's oldest and most respected literary journalists. I quote, As I saw that February afternoon, the thick dull smoke fleeting from in front the steady southwesterly breeze, I wondered what fate had in store for us. Then sometime after, as the fire was subdued, I saw the moon appear over a cloudless sky, then a white smoke like phosphorus formed a semicircle around the devastated area. And from within the rubble and debris, a vivid illumination could be seen through the slowly rising smoke. Let us erase from our memories the temporary inconvenience that this disaster has placed upon many of our people, and look upon it as the beginning of a new era. Many of the unworthy sites to which we were accustomed to were obliterated, and we must therefore hope that history will not repeat itself. End quote. After the fire, many discussions took place in which ideas varied from one to another regarding the effects of the future of Georgetown. One fact, however, was certain, and that was that by our initiative and energy in seeking progress, a Georgetown better than before did emerge from these ruins. Seventy-five years later, the challenge for Georgetown remains. How viable a future does Georgetown have as the seat of government, as a municipality, as a commercial centre and a centre for cultural tourism. How optimistic should we be? Right, hopefully uh, I'm back with you all now. Um, and uh, I'm hoping you were able to see that. I, I slightly lost track of what was going on there, but I hope, hopefully you got to see the, the video. Um, uh, um, it strikes me every time I look at it uh, that it really represents a retreat from wood um, that period in our history. Um, and I wonder if now we need to look again, maybe at constructing in timber. Um, did you have any thoughts on that way that you'd like to share? Well, re replacement concrete seems the obvious thing to do, but which is, which is fair enough, but when you consider concrete building gets burnt out, how often is it actually replaced? Because in a concrete building, you then lose all the infrastructure, including all the wiring, all the plumbing and everything else. And it's probably just as expensive tidying that up before retaining the walls. And then if the walls aren't secure enough, you have to knock them down anyway. So that's a bit of a conundrum in sense. I mean, I'm not sure how often it's happened, but I mean, I'm just looking at it from that point of view. Whereas when a wooden building burns down, 
you know, you've probably got to build it back again. So <laughs> it's got a future in that sense. But that's just that particular opinion. So it's not necessarily a firm opinion, but it's just comparing, you know, like with like. Mm. Yes. And, it, you know, it, uh, it strikes me that, uh, of course, the there are several elements to this and the effectiveness or otherwise of the, 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 the fire service and our responses to fires and, uh, you know, our protocols in buildings and so on. All those things obviously have a, a knock on effect. Um, so uh, it'd be interesting, actually, that slide you showed at the beginning about the incidence of, of fires in that early period to have a comparable list uh, more recently and to see if the areas that are now, because there are sections of Georgetown that are you know, pretty much concrete and to see whether that has actually made a significant difference. Um, I think the main thing to consider is when you consider there wooden buildings that have been around for 200 years, particularly the churches, and if they could survive, in whatever way they survive, it doesn't mean a wooden building can't survive. Yes. So there's a uh, there's a. So I think it's a case of you know how is does the damage take? Is it accidental damage? Can it be prevented? Can you have better measures of protecting buildings generally, whether it be through better fire services, you say, or better in terms of planting around the buildings? So it's a series of different. Not that I'm. I must admit, I like the concrete building. I must admit, I'm, I'm, I like the city buildings very much. And I think that's the best thing Georgetown has ever done. But I think as a compromise, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't rebuild in wood, but you have, you have that choice. But then again, if you're building in concrete, let's build decent design concrete buildings, you see, not putting up monoliths in blocks of steel with glass cladding, which become a big box, big air conditioned box. Mm. Yes. Um very happy to open up uh, for questions or comments now. Um, please try and keep them brief uh, and focused, um, but be delighted to hear um, your thoughts. Uh, Susan, you look like you're poised there with intent. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I, my question for Wayne, lovely. Thank you so much for those wonderful photographs. That was quite an extensive fire. One, two questions. How long did it last? And secondly, um, where did they get their water supply from to extinguish it, assuming the Damarara River nearby? I don't think it, well, the fire began at 3.30 in the afternoon, and by 7 in the evening, it seemed to be all over. So I think it's a case where the winds probably changed slightly, and obviously that helped to some extent. And uh, as you probably heard, they started dynamiting some of the buildings along Water Street to prevent the fire going any further. So I think the actual fire probably raged for about two or three hours and obviously it smoldered into the evening. But obviously water was the big question because I think, um, as far as I remember, the fire station was still in High Street. If Bert Carter is around, he'd probably come in here. The fire station was still where the um, city hall was. So they weren't that far away. And if you look at one of the buildings in the old Hink Street, there was a large vat, water vat there. So they actually had water in the city. I'm thinking about it, it was February, it wasn't during the drought of the year, so they must have had enough water around. It was, it was not the rainy season, but it was still not too dry. So what happened? But I think the prevailing winds probably carried the fire across the street fairly quickly, rather than unexpectedly, because you had quite a wide gap between the Booker stores and the RACS buildings. And as you heard from Vincent Roth, it wasn't really expected to cross the road that quickly. So obviously the winds, prevailing winds from the north probably pushed the fire up more quickly than it should. And then again, you had the very old buildings which went up like tinder. Mm -hmm. I see. And do you know what was the state of our economy after that? Because that would have, certainly would have affected our economy. You know? It's I'm, just not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. I'm just using the parallel during the war because it seemed that things moved fairly quickly. So the, the, the colonial government obviously had money enough to start rebuilding fairly quickly. So from that point of view, they didn't actually drag it on into the 1960s because by 1955, most of those buildings were up and running. And as I mentioned, if you compare what was happening in Britain during that time, there was still bomb damage, collateral bomb damage in the city. So I think Ghana must have done pretty well. There must have been some 
colonial push to get things through because the, the second day of the fire, there were questions raised in the House of Commons, as Hansard reports. So obviously from the colonial government, it seemed to put things in motion very quickly. Okay. And then again, you had bodies like the Royal Agricultural and Commercial Society who were not supposed to be very political, but they had a very strong push to get things done. So by the first day after the fire, they'd already started replanning. So they obviously had the wills and means to go ahead, getting the city up and running again. I see. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question, Wayne, from a, uh, Mr. David Modest. Um, what were some of the causes of these fires and did they impact areas where the general population live? or only the immediate downtown area and some of the residents of uh, colonial officials? Well, this particular 1945 fire obviously was basically in the commercial center. There wasn't any particular living accommodation around fairly close by. I'm not sure, I'm not certain whether anybody actually were any casualties that I'm aware of. Perhaps other people will be able to chip in here. But um, so in that particular 1945 fire, Obviously, it just burnt the commercial area out, and it was 3.30 in the afternoon, so the day was coming to an end anyway. But the other fires, it's difficult to judge because Georgetown was never really very residential in that city park. If you take Lacey Town, Rob Town, I mean, obviously, a few people lived there, but not any large family dwellings as you get further out into Cummingsburg. But there never seemed to be any great threat of um, casualties to life somehow. They, they may well have been, but I'm not aware of any reporting. Hmm. This is uh, definitely, sorry, go, go ahead, Elfrida. Wayne, can you um, confirm how many businesses were actually destroyed? Because I presume you mentioned at the start that um, the initial explosion and so on was where there was, uh, was it the chemical plant? There was a, the Booker's chemical department or drugs, drugs department, isn't that right? It was the drugstore where roughly the Ghana stores is at the moment. And then Booker's had that large block which went around the Booker's garage, which they used to store things like gasoline in the basement, for example. So you've had the Booker's complex and it took you around into Water Street where you had Ferrer and Gomes. And then you had some small uh, five cent stores going towards Sandwich Park. And then it took you right up to the Barclays Bank. And of course, you get that area off Hink Street with Brown Betty and the smaller businesses around the back there. They all obviously got lost as well. But the major complex at that time was just that area around between Rob Street and Church Street. So, so in other words, were there small businesses? Um, Fogarty's was, uh, was severely damaged. I mean, I don't have a memory of a list of the places that were damaged. We have an idea that maybe the center was damaged and the assembly rooms, which of course was not a business. It was a place to gather. Um, because when you talk about rebuilding and how much damage was done to the economy, is Susan's question. It is an interesting one. Um, how quickly were they able to rebuild? How many losses? How much loss? How many livelihoods? You know, um, it's a a different, different from now. Huh? There was a figure quoted somewhere of eighteen million dollars, but that was really in terms of the business property. That, I mean, that did include things like stock in the stores, or the right. books in the library, or other things in the museum. So that was damage mainly to buildings probably but i'm not sure how many small businesses i'm trying to remember because along water street if you think we're sandwich park i still call it sandwich park where munich was right. yeah that <laughs> section going along water street there were one or two small shops there i think there was a five cent store or something so there weren't too many small businesses because the main bookers were obviously the main occupants mm -hmm. obviously sandwich park a big company Fogarty is fairly big so they're all really big players, really. And perhaps because they were very big players, they were able to get off their feet quickly rather than just small businesses trying to um, maintain themselves. Because they all managed to build back on the same sites as they had before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I also was thinking of the fact that, that the, the, the chemical plant or the drugstore or the, whatever, the lab, whatever it was for, 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 for bookers, was part, of course, the, of the whole Booker's machinery, the Booker's conglomerate, so to speak, well, which, which, right. which basically, you know, was, was, was the solid commercial entity in Guyana. As everybody knows BG meant Booker's Guyana, not British Guyana, for that's quite right. a while. That's so where they made the line of call. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's where they made the line of call. But ironically, yes, yes, but, yes. but ironically, when they rebuilt the new Booker's building, the new universal building, 
mm. at the very top of the Booker's building, there was a lab. The Booker's lab was put up there, a sugar research lab at the very top. Okay. So they obviously went back, to, well, obviously the Booker's lab, I'm not too sure what they did up there, but obviously they still had a laboratory at the top of that building. Right, right. That's interesting, but presumably not quite as dangerous as before. <laughs> still there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I just wondered if we have anyone uh, with us this evening who remembers the, seeing the fire. Um, be very nice to have a, an eyewitness account if you if if there is anyone. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, was there ever any question of liability with with a fire that size, or? I mean, did, you know, with the, the, you, you said there was an investigation. Did anything come of it beyond a sort of rap on the knuckles? Or I don't really know how these things work. <laughs> I'm not sure what actually happened. I mean, the blame obviously got spread to the bookers because obviously they were having these dangerous things within the city. But there are other measures which they probably had to... But in the rebuilding itself, they obviously had to build the new regulations, which they mm -hmm. must have done. One of them was obviously using concrete buildings because a lot of them stipulated they wanted to rebuild in concrete as a protection against the fire itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I mean, I, I, I was fascinated that, that that bit of the account where he talks, where Roth talks about the Chronicle building, which to all intents and purposes is actually a lot closer to the scene of the action than uh, the assembly rooms and so on and so forth. But the Chronicle building surviving because they doused it. Yeah. And I just wondered, what did that mean that they were, um, they didn't bother to douse the others because they thought they were safe because they were, the, there was that, you know, huge gap of roadway and whatever. Um, and they, was it a little bit complacent or? It just seems incredible that this this wooden building right next to the scene of the major conflagration survives <laughs> and all these other buildings that are considerably further away. Well, they probably had a long a chance to look on and see what was actually happening, whereas I think the, the fire probably spread across um, southwards so quickly. People didn't have enough time. They just ran up, left the buildings to burn, whereas the they had enough time in the Chronicle building to do something about it, which they obviously did. Yeah. Mm. Mm. No, it's um, it's fascinating. Um, can I can I just add that is that is quite a point because we all some of us remember that the Chronicle building, which was a lovely building, <laughs> was still in existence well into the seventies, I think, if not after. I remember in the seventies that it was still a lovely building. Um, it may have been to do with wind direction, who knows? I mean, it was very close, but we always hear about northeast winds and so on. You know, is it possible that because that building was on the corner, that the, the, the direction of the wind went in a certain, you know, the, the, the fire went in a certain direction and powered on, left think, across the left Yeah, I think, the, the, I think the wind seemed to have had some, um, some effect on the fire, yeah. Mm. yeah. I have to add, can I add, Wayne, I appreciate your highlighting the style, the architectural style, because um, I think it's very relevant. And then you you referred to sort of like the, the Bauhaus kind of style and groupiers and all of that, because it might it, it makes you stop short a little. I mean, you can stand back even now and look at what remains of those buildings that were that were part of the rebuilding. Huh? Um, and, they, and they are very, um, very sort of nicely balanced with those architectural details. Some have possibly have changed. But as ever, you know, one has to come back to a glimpse of a letter I saw a few days ago. Goodness knows when about Ghana being still, Georgetown being still quite a nice city. But the big problem is, shall I bring up 20th, 21st century issues? Garbage and stuff like that. If, if, if we could wave a magic wand and move all the stuff that's excess and, and make sure all the grass parapets and so on are, are cut and make sure all the canals have wonderful glistening flowing water without doing much more to the, the, the infrastructure of buildings, you know, it, would, it seems uh, it would lift the, the, the vistas that are all around this and make everybody feel much better. But then this is partly my pet topic, as you might know. But I think the important part of those buildings, they're all designed by the same architects. 
So there was a unity of style, which they obviously carried through. And that particular generation of architects, when, when you think of it, 19, they must have gone through the 1930s, 1940s when they were qualifying. They would have been influenced by the different European styles anyway, the modern buildings. But if you look at the buildings carefully, the other thing I think, I can't remember what I mentioned, all those buildings carry towers to them, little tiny towers. And the architects deliberately did that because they were actually reflecting the towers that were there before. So if you take the tower of the RACS building, that very tall, what used to be the post office, uh, pilot's office, and you had the tower of the post office. And apparently the Sandwich Parker Tower was carefully aligned to St. George's Cathedral. So the architects took all these into consideration. And right. going back to the sculptures, that bit of sculpture was the architects insisted to be in the building because they thought that was very much part of the architecture. Because that sculpture was supposed to represent circulation. But yes, yeah. unfortunately, the people in the at the time in the 1950s got sight of that statue, that's that sculpture, okay. and it seemed a bit obscene, they didn't quite yes. like it, and it literally got lost. Yes, yes, yes. And this I is a shame, really. So, so yeah. in the end, they had to fill the place with that clock. With the clock, you're right. And it's a, it was a, would have been a lovely detail, actually, um, as you say, you know, very much um, of the era. Well, a little, maybe maybe reflecting a, a, couple, a couple of decades before, but there right. was yeah, because the they all, 20s. The whole idea was supposed to be cast in concrete and shipped right. to the guy right. in sections, but obviously it never, it never happened. Right, yes. But you're right, because once people would have seen sort of like naked, <laughs> naked forms, even partly naked forms, we would have had panic, you know. But that's, very, yeah. but that's very interesting because it just shows how democratic people are at the, at the time, because it was the people of Georgetown who objected to that statue. Okay. And they had a big fight between the architects and the colonial office. So there was a big ding dong row going on between London and the people of Georgetown who completely said, no, we don't want it. So in the end, the architects conceded and they say, well, that's, you know, we won't have the sculpture there anymore. Okay, so, so the colonial office took the side of the people, are you saying? Well, in the end, they, they complied, but they, in the end, they sort of conceded, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> democracy, <laughs> colonial democracy. <laughs> Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. an interesting term. Um, can I just interject? We had a question from Vibe at Cambridge. How did the architectural innovations influence the new QC building? I'm guessing that's Queen's College. Well, that's a point of interest because when you think of the QC building, there again, they were building wood in the 1950s because the QC started in 1948. The plans were going ahead. So the Bishop's High School, Queen's College, and the Technical Institute were all built at the same time. And here you had local building for education being pioneered in wood. And they were quite successful in their own way. They were quite well-designed buildings. And of course the concrete, the, yeah, it's, it's an interesting point actually, because they, they're in parallel in time, in the 1950s, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a case in point where you had new building, because the Queen's College, as far as I remember, it's probably one of the largest wooden buildings in Georgetown in terms of its size. Yes. Um, another question from uh, Sean Bibb. Is there any evidence uh, remaining today of the fire, for example, um, like uh, scars on buildings or anything like that? Um, um, I don't know. Um, all gone. I mean, the biggest scar was left for years would be where the Bank of Guyana was, because that was never built on until 10 years later. And I think that was the most visible scar for a very long time. I think it became a car park and various activities had a market there at one time. But that was the biggest visible scar left after the fire. Mm. And of course, what you said, I, I suppose, not, not really a scar, but a thing removed when you were talking about Hink Street and oh, yeah, the change yeah. in the, the layout there. Um, I see a question from Susan in the feed, uh, and I think you referred to this in the talk, were any buildings codes changed after the fire? I would imagine they were, I'm not sure the details of the regulations, but I'm sure they were at the time, because I, the thing I mentioned before, way back in 1838, they were talking about building buildings in stone, at least the buildings in Water Street should have brick facades, really. And that, of course, never really happened because all the successive fires that took place between then still continued to burn buildings down. So, but 
Yeah, there was a 1945 building regulation. I haven't had a chance to look at that in detail, but there was a regulation which obviously stipulated to some extent how buildings should be put together, at least the spacing between them. Okay. It's, uh, it's interesting though, because actually, I think some, uh, Susan may have raised this, but, or, or Elfrida, but we're coming back to a time where um, everyone's starting to get quite interested about what chemicals you're allowed to have in various parts of the town and, and so on. We're, we're suddenly all a little bit more aware of, of, of um, the possibilities, I think, the, the number of things that could go wrong. Um, uh, because it, it seems, I mean, on, on, on the slim evidence there, it seems as though obviously having the, the chemicals on site uh, certainly accelerated the the um the conflagration um uh and maybe maybe that was what had everybody then on the back foot and not able to respond um uh quite as quickly as as they might have otherwise hmm. right um i think most of the people remember the fire remember them when they were the youngsters who probably saw it as a big event without necessarily understanding what was happening at the time. Yes. Yes, I've um, I've heard some some reminiscences about it, but I think and also, of course, um, most of the people that would be remembering it now would have been children. Yeah. And so it looms even larger in the imagination, you know, as a as a child, you're looking up at this huge thing and so on. So, um, but it, that, that was a, um, I, I, for, I think it's Roth that, that, that says four acres. I mean, that's a, that's a fairly sizable chunk for anyone's yeah. city centre. Um, but as you say, it sort of had a cleansing effect and <laughs> on they went to the, um, yeah, because yes, it was amazing that they did pick themselves up so quickly. Was it because it, when you think of it, don't, within five years everything was rebuilt. I mean, if you look at the RSCS, for example, nineteen fifty-one, the building was opened to the public again after about four or five years, which is quite very quick. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We've got another question comment from uh, Mr. Modest. Um, it's very interesting the, the the disasters that impacted the city significantly were caused by fire and not water. Apart from the change in construction materials like replacing wood with concrete, were there any other significant planning and building policies that came out of the, these events that are still evident today? I can't speak on the detail, but um, from the planning that you see in Georgetown, it makes you wonder what planning there is at all, generally. With putting, because what's basically happened as well, you've got a lot of commercial buildings now being put into residential areas, which is a threat in itself. Okay, they're not necessarily chemical factories, but the fact that you're getting a bigger mix of commercial property side by side with residential property, that in itself presents certain risks to some you know, security or whatever. Mm. So yeah. So it's more a it's more a, a question of zoning, surely than 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 yeah because than I mean, building, a, right? a lot of a lot of the fires are purely accidental. I mean, if one takes going back to the churches, for example, going back to the nineteen thirteen church, the brick down cathedral, that was where you had somebody carelessly leaving apparently a coal pot in in the steeple of the building. The problem with that was the fire started from above, you see, so the, cost of, oh. the firefighters couldn't get up high enough. It didn't start at ground level. And of course, you had the sad case of the Sacred Heart Church, which again, to some extent, I think it was a bit carelessness as well. Once say carelessness, it's a sort of fire you think could have been avoided. And of course, the regulation would there would say in a wooden building, you shouldn't really have candles in a wooden building, which would obviously be quite a strict um, thing for a church. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's what actually happened, because I've, I've actually heard a witness to the church fire who actually stood around and watched it happen. Nobody seemed to have gone up with a wet rag or a hose or tried to put the fire out. It just went off on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just, can I just say that is 
well, I'm sure I'm not the only one. That is a hugely painful um, memory for me even now. Every time I pass, I just, I'm in paroxysms of kind of pain because the original building can, of course, could never be replaced. And um, uh, I do remember at one point they had done some extensive renovation of the original building uh, around possibly the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And I remember stopping my car on that corner sort of obliquely, which would be Kwamina and Main Street. And early in the morning, for some reason, I'm thinking, how many minutes of quiet, peace and quiet can I get to start a drawing? Because I did a lot of pen and ink drawings in those days. Because it just looks so interesting. The beauty, beauty of the building and also the scaffolding was up, you know, showing lots of lines and angles because they were doing extensive renovation. It was such a beautiful building. Um, and as you say, it, you know, we can't, well, we can learn from it, you can't dwell on it, but the fact that there were candles or whatever that were there at Christmas uh, around the little scene and so on. Um, and it just shows you how, for whatever reason, I have to say it, people are just not alert enough and we, we have to be more alert. You know, these are things that are uh, uh, on the ball staff member or somebody, this is how you save things and, and speak up about things, but it just wasn't done. Um, and I do remember hearing afterwards that, um, I see somebody's name there, but it may not be the same person who used to work with the National Trust, excellent person who unfortunately soon after left and emigrated, well, a little while after, um, because they were about to move, it may have been, no, maybe not, but they were about to do some work in that area to do with the church. I don't want to spell it out, but a lot of precious material, apart from the building itself, um, a lot of precious material was lost. And just by horrible, you know, um, coincidence, if that's the right word. Wayne, am I right in thinking, did, the, did that church burn previously? Or was that the only fire? The, sac the Sacred Heart. Yeah. As far as I, I know, there was no fire there. There may have been a small fire, but nothing, nothing like the, the burnt out building. No. Right. No, no, I don't think, I don't think anything major. Um, but they had, you know, things like, dare I say, documentation and so on. And so uh, it was like a double, to me when I heard that, it's like a, a double loss. Um, you know, we can never get it back. Happily, we have lots of photographs, but, and I know people, there was a lot of discussion over quite a period before they decided on a design, which as you know, is a sort of concrete and what have you. It could never be the same. Um, maybe there was enough money to try something different, but, and I've only been in it, I think twice or recently the other day, I went in for the first time, quite honestly, I'm not a Catholic. I don't go to a lot of things like funerals and, and weddings there. <laughs> um, I, for whatever reason I haven't. And I was looking at the shape of it and so on. And the last time I remember vividly being there was from Martin Carter's funeral. And I'll never, ever, ever would forget been, that. Yes, which would have been uh, ever, yes. prior um, to the... Prior which was to 19, 1997. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a whole other story in, in itself. But um, the whole city was almost like a fire happening. Mobs, people running, carrying on, because it was election period again. And I was okay. determined to go to that. Um, and, and you saw this, the whole church was just beautifully sort of filled with the whole um, atmosphere of being there to pay respects to, to this man, you know? So you, there are memories like that, which, um, you know, it was a wonderful church, but we have to just do like you were doing, um, um, Wayne, um, trying to get as much of the documentation for, of record so that we have those memories to pass on to, um, you know, and photographs and so on to other, other, uh, the other generations that come, come on, you know? Yeah, I do implore people around Georgetown to take more photographs. I don't live in Georgetown, so I can't really keep up to date with what's going on, but one or two people do. But unless you look, you look and record, you, you tend to forget because you see something that's here today and it's gone tomorrow, and then yeah. you forget. Yeah. So it's useful for people on the ground to be able to um, record these things for whatever purpose. Yes, and of course, it's the, the, the cityscape is continually changing, even now. Um, with construction and and fires um and and so it it is very um very worthwhile um I if think... i may sorry if i may say um um we also touched on on the, the well the touchy subject is that very issue of <laughs> dare i say it residential commercial which i challenge people um because that's what i'm living with right here and on church street and i said could you tell me what that means i would like a definition 
<laughs> of course, I didn't get an answer. Um, that's a very much wider topic, which we don't have to deal yeah. with today. But you know, it's it's how things are done in in unfortunately an ad hoc way. And I know people need to earn a living, and I know people need to have enterprises and be excited by what they're doing. But there's so many other issues we need to think about. Um, but where is the space available? Who and there there are authorities who are set up. There are authorities who are set up and who are supposed to manage these things in the best way possible. That's all I'm going to say at this point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions, comments? If not, I think we're going to um, just invite some closing remarks from Wayne. Um, Wayne, is it? Oh. Alfreda, one uh, final, I, I, yes, just one final. Yes, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, one, one of the reasons I was hoping to come on today, I had some feedback from a very kind, um, a former a retired civil servant, Mr. Walter Alexander, who some people might know, who was working in education for all his life. And he called me yesterday, middle of the morning, having heard last, the last event, um, Wayne, and he heard a comment I had made, with, with part of the discussion was about finding information about land, I think. And I think I had responded something like, surely the, the, the official gazette would have records. And I can't remember what was said. So he heard that and he called me to say he had been, I think actually in the UK himself recently doing research on land. Um, in fact, it was Dartmouth as equivalent for a friend of his. And he found all the relevant information at the British Library, but it's not digitized, it's on microfiche. So I thought that's very interesting because there may be people, of course, you'd have to be physically there in London. Um, and he found all he was looking for for his friend to do with Dartmouth as equivalent, to do with the land, to do with sale, the sale of the property or whatever, whatever he was specifically asked to look for. And of course, it's called the Royal Gazette, as you mentioned, I think, in your talk. So I think that's very exciting for people who might be keen to find out from their family background or you know how long their families have lived in a place or owned land. Um, that's the place apparently where you can get documentation from the 19th century, presumably even a little before. Okay, so that's really something I had meant to say. Um, okay. Thanks to Mr. Walt Alexander who was so kind. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well just in summing up really, I mean talking about the fire really, the fire took place nearly 75 years ago, which is an awful long time really, it's quite you know almost a century. But it just gives you a starting point of looking at the city as it is now and what will become in the future because there's talk of moving the capital of georgetown somewhere else which is a huge question really for the people for anywhere else so i think in, in looking if one had to move the city out of where it is now what sort of city will you build elsewhere where will you build it and at the same time one has to think what happens to georgetown does georgetown remain just a derelict place so so in, in planning the future I think both have to be done at the same time. Look what will happen to Georgetown as a place for the future and look at the new city elsewhere. And I use the parallel, for example, of the um, Georgetown Cricket Club. One of the most important sites in Ghana, which is gone, which is no longer as it was before because it was never maintained as it should have been because it'd been moved some elsewhere and the focus had been taken out of Providence. And what was a quite a precious part of Georgetown has now become a derelict. And that should have been kept up to date with some other maybe some other feature. So, so looking forward in Georgetown in the future, whether it's the next century or the century after, the people coming along will have to decide what sort of city they want to live in. Do they want to live in a commercial city with big steel girders blocking their view? Or do they want a city they can actually enjoy and move around? So let's think of the future. How do we move from where we are to something into the future? So, so it's, it's a big talking point really. And I hope we continue to make that dialogue at that more meaningful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you um, really on behalf of uh, everyone um, for the series, because it's been a, a gradual um, a, a sort of a set of installments. Uh, and I think we've all learned a lot along the way. Um, I am hoping that we can persuade you uh, to come back uh, in uh, later in the year, maybe we um, and 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 talk about some of the others, the other towns in in Guyana, um, and 
uh, if we can try and chart some alternative histories, because of course Georgetown is not the only, uh, it's not the center of the, the universe, um, there are other places. Um, but it's been really, really enjoyable. Um, so sure. thank you very much indeed. And uh, on, on, as I say, on behalf of everyone, and thank you to our, um, our audience on Zoom and on uh, Facebook and YouTube. It's been, um, it's been, a, been a pleasant experience. Okay. Thank, thank you, you as well. Thank you, Maria House. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.